our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 in the time that we have left this morning. And by God's grace, we continue with these uh, seven letters. We are on letter number uh, uh, five, <coughs> Church at Sardis. Revelation chapter 3. Allow me just to pray before we read God's word. Lord, we, we again just want to be reminded again, it's, uh, it's your word. And Lord Jesus, how you emphatically and clearly gave these words, Lord, to the seven churches. And Lord, we know to be for all churches throughout history and indeed for all those who have an ear. And so, Lord, as we come together this morning, Lord, I pray that we would come with fear and trembling, knowing it's your words, words of love and grace. And Lord, we thank you for the words of correction that you give us, Lord, because you say you discipline those whom you love. And you come and you speak into our lives, and we want to invite you this morning. So again, as we come around your word, Lord, I only just ask, let it be with fear and trembling. Let us not be, uh, uh, Lord, blasé about your word, but Lord, to drink it in. Let it speak to our very hearts this morning. Lord, as you plead with every church, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us today, including myself, all of us, that we would hear what you are saying, not man's opinion. Lord, please help me even now, Lord, to bring out your word that we may learn and we may understand and we may grow and, Lord, we may repent and we may experience your great love for us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen, amen. So let me start off just by reading. This is the shortest of the seven uh, uh, letters, only six verses long. And I'll just start off from verse 1, and it says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. And as always, we want to remind ourselves of the blessings in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And by faith, Lord, we want to claim that blessing now that you would speak to us through your written word. Amen. Amen. So, just a quick recap. We've gone through throughout the last few weeks and months. We looked at these seven churches. Ephesus, the church that lost its first love. And if you want to get a checklist, as it were, how to be a healthy Christian, a healthy church, well, this is a great place to start, to see what the risen Lord Jesus is saying to his church, his bride. And we've got to remember this morning that he loves his bride. Amen? He's coming back for his bride. And he speaks these things in great love 
so that we may learn from it. So Ephesus was the church who lost its first love. And then there was the persecuted church that he so encouraged. There was a compromising church through all, all kinds of compromise that they entered into, and he encourages them to repent. And then we looked at the corrupt church, Jezebel, last time, and uh, all these things. And we see a common theme throughout these things. But now we get to a church, the church of Sardis. And, you know, with all of these churches, you find he says some good things to them, and then at the same time, you know, uh, uh, some strong words of rebuke as it were. And in this case, it seems like it's more leaning towards, this is a church in trouble. This is a church that's not doing well in that regard. And we want to really take notice of this because, as we've said many times, although these were actual historic fellowships, churches, and on uh, the, the timeline, as it were, they speak to all the churches. And we've got to examine our own hearts this morning. He who has an ear, yeah? If there be anything of Sardis in me this morning, or anything of Sardis in our church here today. And I already thank and praise God just for the encouragement and the confirmation, as I always pray for as we prepare for these messages, that the thing that I see with Sardis that we hopefully will see is a church that have taken their eyes off of watching for the imminent return of the Lord. Yes? And so we'll see this. So historical Sardis, just to, to help us understand, and it was all in that Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, as it were, these churches were quite close together, sort of geographically, if you like. And each one, unique message that Jesus gives to, that if you study it in its historical context, you'll see that he is actually speaking into their current situation. Something that was actually happening politically or physically around them at that time. And I wonder to myself if Jesus could stand here today and speak to the church in Three Mile Cross, what kind of references he would make. Perhaps things that we heard this morning, what's happening out in the streets. All kinds of references that Jesus might make. But I believe in all these letters, everything is covered. It's a complete message to the churches. But here, Sardis was again, it was a, a well-known city, very thriving, uh, a, a, a bustling city, lots of wealth. And of course, we know in that time, emperor worship, pagan god worship, it was rife. It was everywhere. And as we said last week, with that worship came all kinds of sexual immorality as part of their worship. Remember, we looked at Jezebel, teaching my people to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. That was in their face all the time. And of course, as these new believers in these settings, it, it's a challenge because they've got to go against the stream, the mainstream. And we're seeing this more and more in our day now. And the danger and the word that I see here inside us is a church that has capitulated under the pressure of all of these things, and we need to watch and pray what it is saying here. Now, Sardis was an interesting place because even in their history there, and all those people would have known the history of Sardis was a city that was healed, built, uh, uh, sort of uh, protected, and that was the arrogance of the kings back then. They thought this city can never be taken. It was like on a hill, and it was secure. But history shows us that twice the city was taken in the most bizarre circumstances. One was with a, a soldier's helmet that apparently fell off the wall, and the other soldiers that were waiting to besiege the city watched where he came down and found a secret passageway, and so they came in and they took the city. And it happened a second time where they were throwing over the dead bodies, and they found another weakness in the city walls, and again the city was taken in another time. So they were well known back then for this picture of you know, this pr proud city that cannot be taken, but yet twice <laughs> they were overtaken. And it reminds us of that scripture in Proverbs 16 that says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's just the way it is. Pride will be brought down. Yes, pride cannot stand in the sight of God. So here, as he says to them, to the angel of the church inside us, these things says, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And he says to them, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Let's quickly just have a look at what the seven spirits of God means here. And you know, you can look at this in Revelation 4, 
5, where John gets this amazing vision of the throne room of God, and we just sang that song. There is a higher throne. And it says, from, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God. And then also in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, John says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So seven lambs, you've got seven eyes sent out into all the earth. And there's something really fascinating. And I've been reading around this and trying to get my head around what does it mean. And of course, in Isaiah 11, he talk, it talks about the sevenfold spirit of God. And uh, so it's, it's not seven individual spirits. It's like it's one spirit, yes? But I want us just to turn very quickly, if we can, just to Zechariah chapter 4, just to help us to understand something that will help also help us understand something of where this church has gone wrong. And so when Jesus would say, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Zechariah chapter 4. Now remember those seven stars in Revelation 1.20, it says these are the messengers to the churches. So he's got these seven stars. These are the messengers to the churches. Jesus has them in his hands. And then he talks about the seven spirit of God, as it were. In Zechariah chapter 4, I'll just read this, and we won't get into this very much in detail. It's a whole different study, but I just wanted us to see something here in a vision that Zechariah sees. In a time when Zerubbabel was to rebuild the temple after its destruction. And it says in verse 1, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And so I said, I am looking. And there was a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. Yeah, we all get the picture of that menorah. We know what the menorah is. Yeah, that's seven lampstands. You always see it in Jewish settings. And Graham had one here last Sunday evening. A solid gold, uh, solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. And two olive trees are, uh, trees are by it, one at the right hand of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hand shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Oh, friends, we can get into a whole study just on this passage in itself. But notice what God is saying here to Zerubbabel and through Zechariah, the prophet. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The picture that we get here of this olive trees and the oil running there is this picture of the Holy Spirit. And here we see, even as Jesus mentioned, you know, we read about the lamp, the seven lamps as it were. 
before the throne. And the eyes, the seven eyes. Here we see, I believe it with all my heart, a reference that would point us back to this very passage in Zechariah that Jesus is referencing. And I'm pretty sure all those that read it, even in that time, would have understood what this is talking about in the Old Testament context. This is talking about the Spirit of God that should be manifest through His church here on the earth. And as Jesus is saying, he has those seven stars in his hands, and he has the seven sp spirits. And those eyes, as it were, on the Lamb that sees all throughout, and even here, the eyes of the Lord that scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. My friends, I see this as a complete picture for us in these times that we live, that there is absolute provision <laughs> entirely by the Spirit of God in the church. And here we see a sad case in the case of Sardis where they've forgotten this. And this is how he opens up to them. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. My friends, there's nothing worse, worse even in the world's eyes today. Let me tell you this. I've done some secular work in my time as well. And I remember one young brother that I worked with was known for being the fiery preaching Christian at work. Go to church every Sunday in a Pentecostal charismatic church with his hands in the air and preaching to the guys at work. But at the same time, distributing pornographic material to his colleagues. And I tell you, this guy was despised by the people that were there. Despised. A name and a reputation that he's alive. But really, there's death in the actions. And people see this, my friends. And this is what Jesus spoke out against hypocrisy. Those who would act out. <laughs> yes. And here he says to them, you have this reputation that you are alive. But you are dead, and it's like they don't even really know it. And it takes the Son of God, the seven spirits and the seven eyes, as it were, the Spirit of God to come and tell them in His grace and His mercy. And He says to them, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect before God. That word perfect there means like complete before God. Other translations might say perfect or complete before my God. In other words, our word, works as a church, my friends, the things that you and I do in, in our faith, as it were, these things will all be made manifest before God one day. And Jesus is forewarning his church here, even the church at Sardis, which has a, a, this, 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 this label upon them of being dead that they can still be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I've not found your works perfect before God. They're not complete. Maybe before the world that looks so wonderful. Maybe before the eyes of everybody around about us that looks so good. The things that the church might do. But before my God, says Jesus, these works are not complete. This is not what you're supposed to do. Do you see? And don't you find that today, my friends, there is a great drive, even by the world, to try and get the church, as it were, engaged in all the social action and do all those things. And you see these things even under the headship of the Pope, if you like. It's just getting the church together. Come on, let's just do all the good works. Let's take care of this for the world. Yes, and we are called to do good works. Absolutely. But not at the cost of compromise. Do you see? And Jesus is beginning to show them here already. They've taken their eyes. They've off of him. They've disconnected from him. They are dead. He is the head of the church. It says we get all our strength and our sustenance from him who is the head of the church. That picture of the olive trees, if you like, that oil flowing into the lampstands, the church is being the lampstands, and so they shine, and then connected to the Lord, the King of Kings, and by the power of His Holy Spirit, just as He reminded 
Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And who better to know that in these days, the church of Jesus Christ. Yes. But it scares me, I must say, friends, when I read these words, and they are hard words from Jesus, but I'm so grateful for them, that even a church would be able to drift away to the point where he would say, you are dead. But he says to them in his love and his his grace, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. My friends, what is the Lord saying to us as individuals this morning? I know many Christians that sometimes say this to me. I used to just pray out in tongues and I used to get words all the time. I used to be so full of joy and overflowing. I don't know where that's all gone. Well, the Lord would say to you this morning, watch, be watchful, strengthen the things that remain. Yeah, it's on you and on me to do that, yes? Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you that was you know, imparted to you by the laying on of hands. Stir it up. <laughs> Get yourself back into it. Get the word of God out. Stop thinking about yesteryear and what it was like there. Lord, fresh manna for today. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, Lord, I need a touch from you today. (laughs) When I go walk out in the streets of Reading and I see these things, I need to know your power, your presence with me and in me. And Jesus is cautioning and pleading with them, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. My friends, it's not a pretty picture. And I don't want to be in this category where the Lord says before God, I have not found your works complete. And this is what Jesus says to them. Remember, therefore, okay, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Isn't this similar to what he's saying to the church at Ephesus? Remember those first works. Don't forget your first love. Yes, remember that day when you got saved, you got baptized, you got filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember that. Just go back to that. It was the grace of God when you could sing with that old hymn, Save the wretch like me. I didn't deserve this. And you just fall in his arms, as it were, in worship and in praise. And that is is what the Lord wants, my friend. And he's pleading with them. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. When you received the gospel, when you heard that evangelist preach, that word and it touched your heart, come on, hold fast. And repent. Turn away. Turn away from all these dead works of compromise. Come back to that. Come back to your first love. Jesus is saying. And then another warning. Second half of verse 3. Therefore, if you will not watch, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know What hour I will come upon you. My friends, in the last church, Thyatira, we looked at last week, and these following churches, I I do see that timeline, as it were. Now we're getting these references and warnings for these churches about the Lord's return. So something of Sardis, something of Thyatira and Philadelphia and Laodicea, something about the last day church. I believe it. And Jesus is warning them here, if you will not watch. Well, what does that mean to watch? Please, will you please just quickly turn with me to Matthew 24, this very famous passage. And I'm just so encouraged this morning. Already, the Lord is bringing out through song, through prayer, through words, (laughs) this idea of focusing on the Lord, being watchful and waiting. From verse 42 of Matthew 24. Now we know this passage really well, I hope, my friends, where Jesus is specifically talking about the times of the end because that was what the disciples were asking him about his return. And he begins to give them all these signs and things that will take place. And no one will know the day or the hour. But he says in verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. 
But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. <laughs> okay, I don't, forgive me this morning, but I don't know how else to read that except to think an hour when you don't expect means it can happen any time. Okay? It's the only way I could possibly read that passage. Maybe my brain capacity can't think of anything else. But when I read it like that, it means at any time. And then Jesus begins to say this, tell us this a famous parable that I think is so overlooked in context of end time things. And Jesus says in verse 45, Who then is a faithful and a wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. <laughs> what a picture. Who is this faithful and wise servant? May it be you, may it be me. Doing what? Doing what a master called us to do. To give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. My prayer for me, my wife, my children, my family, and our church here is that when that trumpet sounds and the Lord comes for his bride, we will be hard at work at exactly the thing that he's called us to do. Whether that be to be the intercessor in your house and your family, to be that single mom, to head up a ministry, to serve in the recesses of the background of whatever it may be, but that's where God placed you to be. May he find you doing that. Yes? Because he will reward you, even though everybody else might see it as insignificant. And this can happen at any time. But Jesus goes on in verse 49. But, verse 48 rather, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. And I will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, Jesus came in love, grace, and mercy. And in so doing, he came to give us, give us these spiritual truths, okay? It's not a small thing. I shudder when I hear things, you know, messages where people jokingly almost talk about these things. If we look at the life of Jesus and we look at the brutality of his death, burial, and all those things that were put on him so that we might be saved, so that we wouldn't have to be cut in two where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth with these hypocrites. Do you see? The Sardis church, having a reputation of being alive but being dead. Because what have we done? We've taken our eyes off the Lord's imminent return. We have said in our hearts, my master's delaying is coming. And Jesus says, I will come on him at an hour when he does not expect. There's only one, one way I can see this. Again, I've heard people argue this. This is the only way I could possibly understand this, friends. If you say in your heart, my master's delaying his coming, you're pushing it down the line. And when Jesus says, I'll oh, come on that servant when he thinks not, means while well, he was thinking it's going to be later, <laughs> well, when he wasn't thinking, was earlier. Do you see? <laughs> and I see this even in the church of Sardis. He has a church that has taken its eyes off the glorious, blessed hope of the imminent return of our King, Lord Jesus Christ. As we were singing this morning. Let's not fall in the trap of this today. We make it all about kingdom now. Yes? 
all this theology that we talk about today, where everything is for now, the blessings is only for now, and we forget that really it's for that kingdom that is to come. My friends, I want to urge every single one of us today, and I'm telling you now we're in a minority amongst Christians today. Sad to say this, but it's true. We're in a minority. For those who still look for the imminent return of the Lord, when that trump will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised to life and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to be with him in the air. My friends, it sounds like science fiction, but it will happen. And I believe it's my personal conviction. If we don't hold this in our hearts, that hope, that blessed hope, we're on dangerous grounds. I believe it with all my heart. And I can see the working out, uh, you know, in churches where they take the emphasis away from that. You can see the working out. Reputation of being alive, but there's a deathliness that begins to creep in. And let me say this as well. People in the world can see it. People in the world can see it. We had a young man here in the school, and he, 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 he attended a previous Christian school. And now comes here, and he said to me once, he said, Mr. E, he said, you know, in the previous school, they were all called themselves Christians. I said, I could see they weren't Christians. He said, but here when I come here, I can see people are really Christians. <laughs> it so blessed my heart. What an encouragement. But for him, as a young guy, to be able to be out there and see, these people call themselves Christians, but they're not Christians. I think the world spotted easier than we do. And they despise it. Be hot or be cold then in that regard, yes? We'll get to that letter as Jesus talks about. I want to urge us this morning. Jesus says, hold fast, remember, repent, watch, my friends. All these passages, you know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Remember the whole story of Lot and his family, how the angels had to take them out of Sodom and Gomorrah, even by hand as it were. Come on, Lot, we cannot do what God called, told us to do to destroy the city unless you come out of the city first. Come, let's go. And they go. But Lot's wife looks back. <laughs> you know, not to see necessarily what's going to happen, but more a looking back, if we understand the story right, about that, 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 that's where my heart is. That's where I want to be. And the Bible tells us very clearly how she turned into a pillar of salt and forever is an example. And Jesus, the very Son of God, when he came to live in this world, my friends, used her as an example and just said that one thing, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Don't get attached to the things of this world. <laughs> There's some very nice things in this world. And indeed, Satan can give you those very nice things because otherwise he wouldn't have offered them to Jesus himself, yes? If you only but bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world, yeah? Don't get attached to the things of this world. And Jesus urging the church, my friends, remember, hold fast, repent, watch, wait in faith. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Because it's a terrible alternative if that's not the case. But he says to them in verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4, You have a few names, even insiders who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So even in this church has now been labeled dead, as it were. There are even a few, there is a remnant they have not defiled. They have not compromised. And when you go look at the Sardis, my friends, in the original context, you'll even see in the archaeological uh, evidence that is there, it was compromised. It was just everything goes in the, in, 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 under the banner of we must all get along. And isn't that the message that we see today again? Come on, Christians, just lay aside these things that you're teaching so that we can all just get along with the Muslims and everybody and we can all be one big happy family. You know, you can still practice your Christianity. It's fine. These things were accepted inside us. And you can maybe even see the Christians perhaps doing good works, being lovely citizens. 
but their works were not complete before God. Maybe before men, not before God. Compromise, the church that goes along with everything. But there are a few, even inside us, Jesus says, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. You know, I think of Isaiah, um, is it 1 verse 8? Let's see if I can find it quick. Oh, sorry, 1 verse 18. Yeah, 1 verse 18. I'll just read it to you. It says, come now. We know, this. we know this verse. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Been washed, cleansed. <laughs> yes, as far as the east is from the west. That's what's been offered to you and to me. That we should stand before God one day with Christ's righteousness imputed to us, white garments that we don't deserve. And they will walk with Jesus. And again, in the historic context, this would have been the, the victorious processions that they would have seen perhaps in the games. Those who were adorned with these white robes were victorious. And they will walk with the King of Kings and they'll be honored. Yes, continue to walk. Those who are walk humbly with their God, they're seeking justice, they love mercy. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And verse 5, Jesus says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Again, it comes up. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Exodus 32, 32. You can make a note of this and read this again, where Moses intercedes for the people. And he says, Lord, blot out my name rather so that they can be saved. Your name is written in the book of life, but there's a, a time when you should reject the grace of our God and not walk in His ways. Your names will get blotted out. May none of our names get blotted out of that book, my friends. But let our names be confessed by Jesus before the Father in heaven. What a glorious day that's going to be when you hear your name. And you enter into all the things that he has prepared for you. My friends, the Bible is full of this. The New Testament is so full of it. Set your fiction, fiction on the things that are above, not on the things here on the earth. Walk by faith, not by sight. I will not blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, all of us, every single one of us here this morning. I can only ask you this morning in closing, and I've been through many of the debates, arguments, even with Christian people, in fact, mostly with Christian people. <laughs> and I can tell you now, when we talk about the death, burial, and even the resurrection of Jesus, most Christians are in agreement. But when you begin to talk about the rapture of the church, the trumpet will sound and we'll meet him in the air, you know, you, you get scoffed at. It's like, no, come on, that's, that's controversial. That's, that's a secondary issue. That's something we, can, we don't have to focus so much on that. Let's just focus on what Jesus did, what he taught us, how we should live, and do all those things. I'm telling you now, my personal conviction is if we take our eyes off of the coming king, imminent coming king for his church, we're going to get caught out. I believe those are the words of Jesus. And I preach this from the bottom of my heart this morning. And I live my life like that, like the Lord should come back even tonight. And my friends, on top of that, you don't know when you should breathe your last, when I should breathe my last. Am I ready? Am I ready to stand before God? Am I going to hear him confess my name before his God? Or am I going to be labeled with one of the hypocrites? Pretended. Had a name and a reputation. 
Wow, that Dion was alive. He was charismatic. <laughs> Look at all the good things he did. But Jesus says, you're dead. Because he sees what's in here. He sees what's in here. And I know, because I love and I trust the Lord, and I know by the power of his spirit, even this morning, he's speaking to us this morning, and he's beginning to show us even things that are in here. <laughs> that he might be saying to us this morning, my child, that's not right. That's not right. Watch, pray, repent. Hold on to the things that you heard and how you received it, yes? I want to close just with this amazing psalm. I read it at the prayer meeting Thursday night. Well, I read it this morning, didn't I? Psalm 50. Where if you read Psalm 50, you'll see this contrast again between those who are genuinely worshiping God and those that are speaking the things of God and the covenant in their mouth, as it were. But God sees straight through it. He's not fooled by it if it's not genuine. But to those who really believe, those who are trusting in the Lord, he says in verse 14, offer to God thanksgiving. My friends, let me encourage you with this. Even in the most difficult situation, just begin to give thanks to God. Yes? Give thanks for whatever you can see, whatever is holy, whatever is righteous, whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever, if it's just a tree you see, Lord, I thank you for that tree that you made so wonderful. Begin to thank God. Change your disposition to praise and worship God. And you'll see how all the things of this world begins to fall off of you. I've experienced this. And God is saying this. Offer to God thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Give to the Lord His due, His praise, His worship, all the things he, you could possibly give Him because He owns it all anyway. And then in verse 15, He says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. <laughs> Do you see what that means? That means that even as, as, as the church, as those who are called by his name, when we should go through trouble, we call upon his name like a, like a child would to their father. And he will come and deliver us, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And in so doing, we glorify him. Yes. My friends, be encouraged this morning. <laughs> be encouraged. I keep coming back just to the simplicity of the gospel and that relationship that we have as a child would have with their father or their mother. Just a simplicity in that. Get your eyes fixed again on the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure you are ready that if that trump should sound tonight, we will be caught up with him in the air. Amen? And if you should breathe your last, you are going to be with the Lord. Victory procession, clothes of white, my friends, and they're not just going to be white sheets. <laughs> These are going to be heavenly, if you like, expensive garments that will wow us for all of eternity. Because you are found worthy, washed by the blood of the Lamb. Shall we stand together and I pray for us this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, your word teaches us so much. Lord, I wouldn't even look at the scriptures in Timothy. It says, those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Lord, and how you warn us to even turn away from such people. Lord, because they may defile us. They may distract us. They may take us away from the simplicity simple truth that is found in you, that, Lord, that we can live a life by the power of your Holy Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Lord, that we can lay down our own strength and our own efforts, as it were, and lay down as dead at your feet, and so allow you to revive us by your Spirit, hallelujah, and so that we can shine for you in these last days. I pray that faith would arise even in this church, Lord, if every single one of us this morning, that we hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, that we would receive from you a fresh touch from heaven today. Lord, that new filling of the Holy Spirit that we so need in this day. Lord, where we've become weary and tired because we run in our own strength. Oh, Father, help us to receive by faith today 
not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Help us, Lord, in these days that we may shine brightly for you. Father God, we praise you, we worship you. And I pray that, Lord, as you revive us by your spirit, that you give us a renewed watching and praying and waiting for the King of Kings. Lord, that bride, groom that will come for his bride and that we may be found ready, waiting and so in love with you. Lord, I pray, revive, revive us in this again. Lord, we bring to you so much of the church, not this, this church, but churches throughout the world, Lord, that have turned their eyes away from these things and are just merely trying to work out, as it were, our faith in this world, instead of looking to you, knowing you will return as you promised. And that cry of Maranatha would return, Lord, coming from the very Spirit of God within us. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Hallelujah. So we praise you, we worship you this morning. And I ask that you bless our hearts. Reiko, would you mind just leading us in that new song? We'll meet him in the air, yes? A good time for us to get to know it as well. So let's rejoice in this. Amen. We will meet.